can see see from my O, I like to brand. And uh, that's a little bit of what I want to talk to you about. Uh, if you've had a chance to look at the earlier content, I thought what I would do is bring that up to date a bit. Um, one of the things about social media is the fact that it changes rather rapidly. And we're certainly seeing a lot of that amid the global pandemic. Hope everybody can see the slides. We'll get that started. So the focus that I wanted to bring to this is the issue of video, because I think there are great opportunities, there are challenges too in using video, but I think at a lot of different levels, our communities have an opportunity to use video and leverage social media. And I'm drawing from a white book from Sishin that came out recently, but it looks a lot like a lot of the charts that we've shown in the past. The number one aspect that I wanna talk about for this 15 minutes is the importance of planning and how planning really drives whatever goals that you come up with for um, what you wanna do in the next year and a half or so. A lot of social media marketing social media communication has to do with branding and raising awareness about something. Uh, being in a place to create content that may improve your reputation, may give you a share of what people are thinking about at any given time. It may drive traffic to your digital properties, what we call own media. These include obviously your website, I'm um, looking at uh, Donna, and we worked last semester with Donna on her website at Morton James Public Library, but also your social media properties, such as uh, your Facebook page. Now, businesses, of course, are looking to convert all of this to money, to revenue. In the nonprofit sector, we are wanting to do something else. It might be that we're wanting to drive people to our events. It may be that we want to increase participation or engagement in our content, uh, or it might be something completely different. And that's, I think, what you're gonna to wanna to be talking about this afternoon. Now, one of the things that I've been spending some time in the last few weeks on as I ramped up for my two summer classes is really looking at what this space right here in the upstairs uh, loft of our little house here in Midtown Omaha can do. This actually used to be our daughter's bedroom and before that it was our son's bedroom and they're off in Chicago and Michigan and so I've been able to commandeer this as my home office and begin to see what we can do with it. You're looking at Dennis Yu who is a social marketer, has thousands of followers on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and elsewhere. He runs a company called Blitz Metrics, as you can see in his background. And one of the things that he has been talking about is, you know, we have this difficulty. I experimented on Zoom where everything is happening in Zoom right now um, with virtual backgrounds. And I wasn't very happy with my glowing, growing fuzzy hair that was kind of getting caught in the lights. And it just wasn't a natural look. And so Dennis and I talked last week in class about kind of what he's been doing. Now, he spent a lot of money to, to take over, I think, his living room as a studio. Uh, I'm doing it in a small space on a small budget, a few hundred dollars. And my, my O in the background is uh, simply our older Apple TV unit that I am channeling my older iPhone. I can put any photo I want on that back screen. So that's how you're seeing this process. And so when I say optimize, 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 I mean, this is, this is true of your content on Facebook. It's gonna be true of your website, obviously, but it's also gonna be true of your look. What does the lighting look like? What does the sound look like? Uh, what is the camera angle? Is it, is it eye level? And how much can you use video then to engage with people? I've of course been watching what Gothenburg has been doing and uh, one of the things that they've been doing is promoting 
Zoom Lives every Friday uh, using their Facebook page to send that link out to people who are followers on Facebook and then recording those hourly uh, updates to their YouTube channel. Now, what they haven't been doing as much of is sharing that back out, those recordings across the social media channels. And we all have this opportunity to create video, create content like we're doing today, perhaps break it into shorter chunks that are viewable and share it across our social channels. So I uploaded after my class last week, a 38 minute Dennis Yu video conversation with myself and my class. And you can go when you upload video to analytics. And what you see is I have about 45 views so far, a total of almost five hours watch time by these 45 or so viewers. But what's most interesting is that my audience retention is about six minutes. So we go back to the video and say, what happened at six minutes that people saw that and then moved on? And could I edit that video further? Because I did for other social channels and chunk it to a much shorter uh, time frame. That's how data feed back into what we do. The first phase of the project has done a lot to show us what the possibilities are. Ravenna has and continues to do great Facebook Live conversations amid this crisis. In the past, about a year or so ago, the flooding was happening in Ashland and the fire department was live with a phone doing live streaming. So a lot of things are possible even in a pandemic because we can get out into the field with a smartphone and do this kind of live streaming to our Facebook page. Also noticed Donna, the library has an event coming up and a friend of ours in Michigan outside of Detroit is also doing story time readings for kids, uh, basically putting it on their uh, Facebook calendar uh, with a um, Zoom link and of course a password. You could also do this with your email list if you want to keep it um, less public. So the questions that I think are going to be coming up this afternoon involve doing a little bit of reflection in each of your communities about who is a champion in your community, who are what we might call thought leaders, people who are already active on social, are already community leaders, but also people who are not afraid to be active on social, who have already perhaps built up a following and even a robust social network. And so the question is, where can you find these social networks that we're going to be talking about? And on the left is my home screen on my iPhone. And you can see right away on this home screen what's important to me. The camera's important. I've taken over 50,000 photos that I use regularly in my social media content. I'm always taking photos because if I have my own photos, I have less worries about copyright and ownership and getting permissions and those kinds of things. I'm the owner of those photos. Uh, so photos are really important. They're particularly important, of course, in Instagram, which is a photo centric site. Um, because I'm an old news guy, I watch a lot of news from the AP and other news sites. Uh, and weather is always important in Nebraska. You know that. It changes on a dime. Then comes Facebook. I have a personal network, but I also manage uh, about eight pages on Facebook for the School of Communication at times, for the Social Media Lab, uh, for our Journalism and Media Communication Program, for my own Professor Jeremy brand. Uh, Twitter uh, is something that I'm on every morning and late at night. TikTok is something that I'm doing social media listening right now on. TikTok, uh, I've not posted a single video on TikTok, but I'm learning what's going on there because it's, a, it's probably the, the up and coming site. 
I think it sort of surpassed Snapchat in this regard for young people. And if you're targeting young people, you're going to want to look at some of these sites, such as Reddit and TikTok. Um, and uh, let's see, I pet cube because we have a camera when we're gone that we can watch our cat. Zoom and Canvas for this project and teaching. And, you know, email is still the first from the 1990s and perhaps most important killer app, we would say. Something like 65% or so of our time is still spent dealing with email. So have you used MailChimp or another tool to cultivate an email list? And then this social network that I'm showing from Twitter is from Omaha Gives last week the fundraising campaign that we've been doing with our nonprofits for half a dozen years. And, um, and it's, it's sponsored by the Omaha Community Foundation. They're the number one thought leader on uh, this particular social network, that hashtag Omaha Gives. You can see I've nudged my way in there by sharing these maps with the community and showing who's leading in the Twitter conversation. There is a relationship between leaders here, such as the Humane Society, and how much money they've been able to raise with Omaha Gives. They're always one of the top, always one of the top fundraisers for this particular campaign. So what this is, is a picture of what a network looks like, and, and we can talk about that later in this project. Now, there are challenges and opportunities, and if you were a fan of The Office, you might know John Krasinski, in the middle of the COVID crisis in New York, he launched from his home office an eight-part program that took off and had thousands of viewers sharing good news, the, the Good News Network, basically trying to give people hope and optimism in this difficult time. It really took off. Uh, and recently, in the last few days, he announced that CBS had bought the rights to his program, to his idea of good news. And his fans, though, there was a backlash because they felt like he was selling out and that they'd been sort of used by, by what he was doing. And so he's had to get on social media and try to explain why he's now leveraging a, a news network for this program, this idea that he developed. Uh, closer to home, uh, a cover retired colleague of ours. I was on Instagram yesterday morning and I was jolted to find out that he and his wife who had been living in Chicago since retirement that he had gotten uh, coronavirus and he passed away Saturday uh, from it uh, because of um, lingering complications. And the gerontology department had posted this tribute to Jim Thorson I'm a friend of theirs on Facebook and I had the algorithm didn't show me this post because algorithms show you things they think you want to know on Facebook. And that's why we have to sometimes promote posts as Ashland, Nebraska has done and pay, pay to be seen. So I had to get the information um, through Instagram and then through UNO's website and that led me back to go go find my friend on Facebook. Last night, Tunet Powell, who is a graduate of UNO and was a national champion public speaker, spoke to my class. She is recording today the commencement speech for UCLA where she just completed her doctorate. And I got an Instagram this morning and here was her post from during the Zoom session where her friend had created a meme. So what this tells you is when People are creating content, are recording video. It can have a life. It can carry on through these other social media channels. So the question on the table, I think, today is what will normal look like on the other side as things open up? And how does it relate to the overarching themes and questions that Kim and Roberto and Charlotte have raised about civic participation, which you'll hear more about from Roberto, community leadership. And I think the key word is trust because we can build trust on social media. And Ashland, I think, is the best example of a community that really used uh, social media 
to its advantage to build trust over the last couple of years. Now, what I'm also going to suggest to you is that platforms like LinkedIn and Twitter allow you the opportunity to build profile, to brand yourself, and to create a social network of followers. So if you go to my Professor Jeremy Twitter profile, you're going to see that I'm promoting the two books that Kim talked about. Actually, the social media communication book has just this morning gone to the printer. So we're struggling to get processes going amid this uh, pandemic as well. So that returns us to where we started, which was what do you wanna, what do you wanna do? What results at the bottom of this funnel do you wanna achieve? It's really up to you. It's really your call. You're gonna know best in your communities what you've done, what you aspire to do, and what, more importantly, what will work in your context. Because what we each do in our context is not necessarily, I think, what, what is best for you. And so I think that goes to the overarching steps in this process. And it really begins with a plan. And hopefully, I guess the one suggestion I would make to close this out is that your plan leads to some additional listening. Because I think social listening is the place to start plans because by listening closer to what is happening in your social media conversation in your communities, you're going to be better in a position to know appropriate engagement that you can ultimately measure. Okay, 